Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, I'll tell you a funny story about uh, coming down to uh, the Diocese of Charleston. Um, I had uh, finished my license, which is an advanced degree in, in theology, which qualifies you to teach in a Catholic university or seminary. And uh, uh, one of my professors knew Bishop Baker, and uh, he knew that uh, I'd done some missionary work. And he said, you know, Baker, Baker really needs priests down there, and it's kind of a missionary territory. He said, you might fit in there if you could stand living in South Carolina. <laughs> so, uh, and as Christmas, the only places I've been are Greenville, Somerville, and Charleston. So there's not much not to like about any of those places. So I've been, been very blessed. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here with you tonight. And uh, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail, <coughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of the Rosary, pray for us. Well, um, I guess I'm here to talk about the four last things, um, which, let's see what we come up with here. You know, it's, uh, it's appropriate, I guess, especially as we're coming to, uh, to the end of a year and the end of a church year, that, uh, that we look at these, um, you know, the last things, the, uh, uh, the, end of, uh, the end of human life, and, uh, and then what happens to us after death, and then the effects that the knowledge of these things should have, us, uh, have on us here and now, and how, uh, how we live our lives. The, um, can you hear me all right, Kristen, back there? Yeah. Uh, the four last things are the names given in Christian tradition to what we believe happens to human beings after they depart from this life. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Let me say a little bit about, about, uh, about each of these. And I guess, you know, the, the amazing thing is that, I mean, we don't know where we come from and where we're going, but we do, uh, we're taught in our tradition that God created each human soul individually. And, uh, and that once we're created, you know, we, um, we're here for eternity, not here in uh, this earth necessarily, but we exist for eternity. And so uh, what, does, what does death mean? I mean, we, uh, you know, there are all kinds of speculations about it. You look at, you know, all kinds of different religious traditions. You know, I was even thinking today, you know, a lot of people today say they're secularists or atheists or whatever, but they still, you know, have some idea. You know, they don't really think they, they just completely disappear after death. They think there are, you know, infinite dimensions or something like that, or they go and, you know. Uh, you know, it's very hard for the, uh, and, and it should be hard for the uh, human mind to imagine, you know, complete extinction. But certainly death uh, is a, um, a great mystery. Um, theologically, we define death as the separation of the body and the soul. Because as human beings, we're, um, we're a compound, a composite of, uh, of spirit and matter. And uh, we know that, uh, that, uh, that when we die, the, the matter remains behind. It decomposes. It goes back to the earth. But you know what happens to the spirit, um, that uh, that immaterial part of us, the uh, the part of us that uh, uh, that learns, that uh, that understands, uh, that comprises our intellects, our thoughts, our emotions, our memories. Uh, that immaterial soul uh, will survive, and um, we uh, we believe will be brought into the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. By the way, if there's anybody who has any questions or anything, just feel free to, you know, raise your hand or shout something out. It's not. Uh, 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 and uh, and in the presence of Christ, we are going to be judged. Death involves a letting go of all that we have held dear, of all that we are and have been, as we present ourselves before that seat of judgment. We may be given back some or all of those things family, possessions, memories, 
We may even be given better things than what we have given up, but we need to turn over everything we have to the judgment of God. And in the light of that judgment, who can trust in his own merits? If you, O oh Lord, will count iniquities, O oh Lord, who can stand? What do we bring with us to that judgment after death? And uh, that reminds me of a little story. There was a, an old miser who was going to die, and he was determined to take his money with him. So uh, he called in his priest, his doctor, and his lawyer, and he gave them each a bag with $50,000 in it. And he asked each of them to place the bag in his coffin so he could be buried with his money. Well, the, uh, the miser died and was buried, and at the wake, each of them came up and placed his bag in the coffin, and so the miser was buried. And uh, about a month later, the priest, the doctor, and the lawyer all got together for a drink. And the priest said, you know, I have a confession to make to you guys. I didn't put the whole $50,000 in the bag. I had, a, I had a family in the parish who were going to lose their home, so I took $20,000 to help them, and I only put $30,000 in the coffin. And the doctor said, you know, I did the same thing. I had a patient who needed an operation, so I used 20000 to help him, and I put the rest in the coffin. And the lawyer looked at them sadly and said, I can't believe you guys, two honest professional men who would not respect a dying man's wishes. I wrote him a check for the whole 100000 and put that in the <laughs> coffin. And with it. <laughs> well, no lawyers here, I trust. That's so, that's so, that's so, that's so. Well, when we die, we certainly can't take any money or physical possessions with us. And even more importantly, when we meet our Lord, he is not going to ask us how much money we made or where we went to school or what clubs we belonged to or where we lived. Rather, he is going to ask us how much we loved. Jesus tells us precisely that in the famous parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then the king shall say to them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom pre prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty and give thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Then he shall say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? And then he shall answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Well, we all know this passage. It was uh, the favorite biblical passage of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. As Kristen mentioned, I, um, I did a lot of work with the missionaries of charity as, uh, when I was preparing to go to seminary and then when I was still in seminary. And um, I heard Mother Teresa speak several times, and she always loved to, to repeat this gospel and to meditate on it and to, uh, 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 to contemplate it. In one of her works, she writes, in order to help us deserve heaven, 
Christ-centered condition, that at the moment of our death, you and I, whoever we might have been and wherever we have lived, Christians and non-Christians alike, every human being who has been created by the loving hand of God in his own image, shall stand in his presence and be judged according to what we have been for the poor, what we have done for them. Christ said, I was hungry and you gave me food. He was hungry not only for bread, but for the understanding love of being loved, of being known, of being someone to someone. He was naked not only of clothing, but of human dignity and of respect through the injustice that is done to the poor who are looked down upon simply because they are poor. He was dispossessed not only of a house made of bricks, but because of the disposition of those who are locked up, of those who are unwanted and unloved, of those who walk through the world with no one to care for them. Do we go out to meet those? Do we know them? Do we try to find them? You know, Mother Teresa um, was a, uh, a high school teacher at a, a girls' school in Calcutta for, you know, for upper middle class girls. And uh, one day she found a, a dying man outside the gates of the convent. And she went and put him in a, in a wheelbarrow. And she took him to uh, one hospital after another. And they kept rejecting him. And finally she found, she found one that would take him. And she said that, you know, if I hadn't picked up that, that first man, I never would have picked up another. We have to start uh, somewhere with, uh, with our lives. And I think we do that, as, as Mother Teresa was set, was, says, by, uh, by seeing Christ in those, uh, in those who are in need. Not simply materially, uh, although certainly there are many of those in all parts of the world, but emotionally, uh, spiritually, you know, those who are crying out, you know, those who are lonely, those who are sick, uh, those uh, who need someone sometimes just to, uh, just to sit and talk to them, just to, uh, you know, uh, uh, share something of their lives, uh, to, uh, you know, to tell a joke, uh, even a bad joke, you know, uh, to, uh, uh, to reach out and uh, to, uh, to experience, you know, that, uh, that, se that, sense, of, that sense of humanity, that sense of loving kindness, to, uh, to see Christ, uh, especially Mother Teresa would say, in the poorest of the poor, but really in everyone around us, because we're all poor in some way. We all have those moments when uh, we need someone to reach out and touch us, someone to, uh, 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 to help us along the way. Uh, and uh, we're all crying out and to, uh, to experience that love and that kindness. And, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very beautiful image and one that uh, our Lord tells us is going to be the touchstone of, uh, of the judgment there. Let me just say a word about judgment too because in our Christian tradition there are actually two judgments. There's what we call the particular judgment which um, each of us will uh, encounter uh, directly after we die. Um, and, you know, we'll, uh, we'll meet our Lord and, you know, go with the sheep or the goats, as it were. Uh, and then there is the, um, the, uh, the general judgment, uh, the, the last judgment at the end of time, when it's kind of as, as a summary, uh, everything, time will have come to an end at that point, uh, the universe will be created anew. And these are things that we talk about in the book of Revelation. It's... Uh, uh, a rather, you know, mysterious thing, exactly what that's going to entail. But that's when the general resurrection of the body will take place and we'll be given a new body and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. But I think it's that particular judgment that we, uh, we need to focus on. Uh, St. John of the Cross says, at the evening of our lives, we will be judged on our love. And it's that love that... Um, you know, that we have to, uh, we have to concentrate on and uh, prepare ourselves as well as we can. You know, I'm just thinking when, uh, when we're young, uh, you know, we may not think about death all that much. Some young people do, but they're considered rather morbid, I think. But as we get older, you know, uh, death becomes uh, a reality. We see our friends and our family uh, die. 
And we come to prepare, you know, ourselves for death. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. In confession, people often will come to me and, uh, you know, they'll want to, cons you know, confess sins from the past. Sometimes they're unconfessed sins or sometimes they, they just want to go back and say, I confess this, but I don't know how well I did it, you know, I want to repeat that. And, and sometimes they're very grave sins, sometimes they're, you know, quite minor sins. But people are thinking about death, they're thinking about how to prepare themselves, and that, you know, all, all the things that that judgment is, uh, is going to entail. And um, maybe it's, uh, it's appropriate here to, uh, to say a word about purgatory. Um, because uh, ultimately, as that par parable in Matthew 25 tells us, there is no intermediate state that we're either going to go to heaven or to hell. But uh, purgatory is a sort of preparation for heaven for those who are assured of eternal salvation but have uh, not you know, purified all those things that, uh, uh, that, that they may have experienced uh, in this life. And so that any venial sins or any unsatisfied punishments that they have to make up for. And um, it's, um, we don't really know all the things that uh, are going to go on, but we do know when we look back on our lives, you know, we can see that, uh, you know, we've, we've hurt a lot of people, uh, we've failed in a lot of ways, and uh, we don't know how God is going to judge those things. We hope that, you know, we've tried to make up for that, to, to expiate any sins we have committed, but yet, you know, there are all kinds of things that, um, you know, all kinds of consequences that go on in human life. And we have to be prepared uh, uh, to answer those. Uh, those of you who are interested in, in purgatory, there's a very beautiful um, uh, description of it in uh, a, uh, a work, a long poem by Cardinal Newman, who incidentally is going to, his feast day is actually on this coming Wednesday and he's going to be beatified, uh, or rather canonized, uh, next weekend. Um, but it's called The Death of Gerontius, and it's uh, the, uh, you know, a man who experiences you know, this vision of angels and you know, the, the, the beauties of the afterlife, but also uh, when we can you know, come face to face with that, we also come face to face with our own inadequacies, our own failures. And, uh, and so that, uh, you know, purgatory is, in, in a sense, uh, a healing process that, uh, that we have to go through in order to, to experience the, uh, 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 the, uh, the beauty and the joy of heaven because we're not, uh, not necessarily going to be ready for it uh, at, uh, at the moment of death. Well, as I said, you know, in our Christian tradition, um, you know, we're not born again, we're not or reborn again. You know, we don't come back as, you know, a dog or a cat or, you know, the, uh, the emperor of China or whatever. We, uh, we, come, to, we come to a final, uh, a final destination, either, either heaven or hell. And if hell, it's really probably not good to speak too much. Again, there are lots of, lots of famous images of this, you know, in Dante, of course, and uh, Milton's uh, Paradise Lost. Um, but, you know, there may be some more kind of homely images that, uh, that we, uh, or ones that maybe speak to our contemporary situation a little bit. I was watching, I don't know if many, many, any of you have seen this show, but there was a, a famous episode of The Twilight Zone uh, in the early 60s. And I just watched it again the other day about, um, it was about a, um, a, a criminal, a petty criminal, who uh, robs a store and is, is then killed as he's trying to get away. And when he wakes up, you know, there's a man in a white suit there who helps him up and, you know, and takes him and, you know, <clears throat> takes him to a beautiful apartment and gives him all the money he wants and, you know, wonderful food, beautiful women. They go to a casino and he, you know, plays roulette and he keeps winning and he plays a slot machine and he keeps winning and he's in, you know, he thinks this is heaven, you know, everything is going perfectly for him. And um, 
then they jump ahead a month later, right? <laughs> he's still going to the casino and winning all the time. He's still got all these beautiful women, all the food, everything that he could possibly want. And he can't understand why he's here. And he says to, uh, you, know, to, uh, uh, you know, to the man in white, he says, you know, there must be some mistake, you know. I shouldn't be here. I should be in the other place. And he says, well, you know, we have a, we have a hall of records. We can go check your records. He said, well, yeah, you know, when you were seven years old, you killed a dog. You know, when you were, you know, you know eight years old, you know you, you know, you beat up somebody. You started a gang. You robbed a bank when you were 10, blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on and on. And he said, no, no, you're definitely in the right place. And he said, but, but how can that be? How can everything? He said, no, you know, you're, you're in the right place. And he said, but I can't stand it here anymore, you know. Everything is going right. So <clears throat> that's, um, that's, you know, one of the, one of the images anyway that, uh, of, of hell. Another famous one is uh, uh, a play called No Exit by uh, uh, the French uh, uh, existentialist playwright uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. And it's, you know, three people in a room with one another who, you know, can't stand one another, <laughs> and, they're, and they go through all these, you know, various, uh, you know, arguments and uh, uh, debates, and they find out, they find, and they finally, you know, end up saying, hell is other people. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, well uh, it can be, I guess. Uh, another, another image of hell that, that I always found interesting was, uh, in a play by uh, George Bernard Shaw. Um, the play is Man and Superman, which is a delightful comedy, a kind of a reversal of the Don Juan legend. But the third act of Man and Superman is called Don Juan in Hell. And it's, it's, it's actually a dream, but it's a philosophical debate between Don Juan, a, uh, a girlfriend of his, the girl's father who actually killed Don Juan, and the devil. And they go back and forth arguing because Don Juan is in hell, but he's not very happy there. He's bored with it. And the, uh, the girl's father is in heaven, and he's not very happy with that. He's bored with being in heaven. And, uh, you know, and the, but they, the devil explains to them, he said, you know, really, there's no you know, physical barrier between heaven and hell. You just have to be, you know, think of where you want to be. He said, you know, being in heaven is kind of like being at a classical concert on earth, you know. There are a lot of people who, you know, think they have to go there and listen to Bach or Mozart or, you know, Mendelssohn or whoever. Um, but they really can't stand classical music. They'd much rather be, you know, in a disco or <laughs> a rock concert or whatever, <laughs> you know, a music hall. And, uh, and uh, he said, you know, all the best people, he said, are in hell, you know. Popes and cardinals and millionaires and movie stars are uh, so. Um, whereas Don Juan, you know, is saying, you know, all you, you know, you're just a bunch of hypocrites in hell, and you're just having a good time, and you're not, you know, thinking about, you know, great philosophical issues, which uh, Shaw's Don Juan is uh, is obsessed with. So, you know, again, uh, you know, it may be this idea that. You know, but where uh, where we end up, or where we you know where we truly want to be, what our true interests are. Uh, it's very very striking in uh, in Dante's Inferno when uh, uh, Dante and Virgil go to uh, cross the river Styx into hell uh, with the souls of the damned. The souls of the damned fly off immediately, and they go. They know exactly where they belong and where. Uh, where their eternal destiny is, whether they're the lustful or the, you know, the, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the gluttonous or uh, the wrathful, what, whatever it is, they know exact, even though they're going to be miserable there and going to suffer horrible torments, that's the only place they can imagine being. So, uh, you know, as I say, hell is not something that, uh, you know, that we would want anyone to, to wish to go to. And of course, it's symbolized, uh, in, as in the parable, by that unquenchable fire. And it's interesting, too, that the church has never definitively said that anyone other than Satan and the rebel angels is in hell. And um, this great Swiss theologian, uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar, uh, 
wrote a little book um, called Dare We Hope That All May Be Saved. Uh, and, you know, that's a, a rather, you know, pious and, you know, kind hope, but we don't really uh, know what that's all about. We have to acknowledge the reality of hell and the real possibility that an unknown number of people will go there. And indeed, at some periods in history, theologians have thought that the vast majority of human beings, and indeed the vast majority of Christians, are destined for hell. So we should not dismiss it simply as a superstition or as somehow unworthy of a loving God. Dante said that above the gate of hell it was written, all hope abandon ye who enter here. But he also said that that gate was made by the highest wisdom and primal love. So if the uh, torrents of hell are too terrible for the human imagination, in a like manner the, uh, the joys of heaven are beyond all our understanding and description. A common image of heaven in the scriptures is that of a wedding feast with the joy, fellowship, and abundance of, of good things. And St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. But we do know that those in heaven behold the face of God, the beatific vision. And St. John tells us, beloved, we are God's children now. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And certainly within that vision of God, if we are so blessed to attain it, we will find the fulfillment of all that we have known and loved, and of all that we have ever longed for, and we shall enjoy that peace which passes all understanding. And a vision of that state of peace has been given to us by uh, T.S. Eliot in Little Gidding, the last of his four quartets. Eliot writes, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. Through the unknown remembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning, at the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard, in the stillness between the two waves of the sea. Quick now, here, now, always. A condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flame are enfolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. What is the true meaning of life? that question will only be answered definitively after death. But we do know that our life here on earth is transitory. We are given a certain amount of time on earth. We do not know how much. What comes before and after is a mystery. There is a charming story in St. Bede's ecclesiastical history of the English people. In the year 627, King Edwin of Northumbria called a council to discuss whether the kingdom should accept the Christian faith. And one of his nobles got up and spoke as follows. The present life of man, O king, seems to me, in comparison of that time which is unknown to us, like to the swift flight of a sparrow through the room where you sit at supper in winter with your commanders and ministers and a good fire in the midst where the storms of rain and snow prevail abroad. The sparrow, I say, flying in at one door and immediately out at another, while he is within, is safe from the wintry storm. But after a short space of fair weather, he immediately vanishes out of your sight into the dark winter from which he emerged. So this life of man appears for a short space, but of what went before or what is to follow, we are utterly ignorant. If, therefore, this new doctrine contains something more certain, it seems justly to deserve to be followed. Our faith, then, does indeed tell us what to expect after death, judgment followed by the rewards of heaven or the punishments of hell. And so, in the light of that destiny, perhaps we should ask how we are to live our lives here and now. 
St. Jose Maria, the founder of Opus Dei, once asked, doesn't your soul burn with the desire to make your God happy when he has to judge you? He found the key to using our time here on earth well was to do the will of God. This is the key to open the door, he said, and enter the kingdom of heaven. He who does the will of my Father, he shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Many great things depend on whether you or I live our lives as God wants. We are stones, blocks of stone, that can move, can feel, that have completely free wills. God himself is the stone cutter who chips off the edges, shaping and modifying us as he desires with blows of the hammer and the chisel. Let us not try to draw aside. Let us not try to evade his will, for in any case, we won't be able to evade the blows. We will suffer all the more and uselessly. Instead of polished stone, we will be a shapeless heap of gravel that people will trample on. The wholehearted acceptance of the will of God is the sure way of finding joy and peace, happiness in the cross. It is then that we realize that Christ's yoke is easy and his burden light. It only takes a second before starting anything, ask yourself, what does God want of me in this? And I think here the concept of vocation becomes important. God, I said, has created each one of us out of nothing. Every human soul is a new creation, and every human soul has a purpose. In a famous meditation, Cardinal Newman wrote, God has created me to do him some definite service. He has committed some work to me which he has not committed to another. I have my mission. He has not created me for naught. If I am in sickness, my sickness may serve him. If I am in sorrow, my sorrow may serve him. He does nothing in vain. He knows what he is about. Some of us may be called to a specifically religious vocation as priests or monks or consecrated men or women. But most of us are called, called to live in the world, to follow a secular occupation, to marry and raise a family, and to participate in the activities of social and cultural life. Of course, our circumstances and our interests will change throughout our lives. But at each stage of life, we need to assess where we are, what our gifts and talents are, and what God is calling us to do with our lives. And this calls to mind another parable, perhaps not coincidentally from Matthew 25 also, where it immediately precedes the parable of the sheep and the goats. For it will be as when a man going on a journey called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. And then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug it in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not winnow. So I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Here have what is yours. But the master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sowed and gather where I have not winnowed. 
then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent away from him and give it to the man who has ten. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast that worthless servant into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. It was uh, in meditating on this parable that John Milton wrote one of the most beautiful and poignant poems in the English language. Milton was already an accomplished poet when, in the year 1649, he was appointed to be Secretary of State for Latin in the Commonwealth government of Oliver Cromwell. And it was at the height of his political activity and influence in 1654 that Milton went totally blind, probably from glaucoma or a detached retina. And it seemed that his active life was over and he was going to live in poverty and uh, it, you know, uh, obscurity for the rest of his life. And yet in the depth of despair, he wrote this sonnet. When I consider how my light is spent, ere half my days in this dark world and wide, and that one talent which is death to hide, lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent to serve therewith my maker and present my true account, lest he returning chide, Doth God exact day labor, light denied, I fondly ask. But patience to prevent that murmur soon replies, God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. He who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding speed, and post o'er land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. Well, we never know what plans God has in store for us. After his forced retirement from government service, Milton was living in poverty and despair, resigned to a life of quiet inactivity. And yet it was in those final years of his life that he wrote his greatest poems, Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, and Samson Agonistes. So uh, that's uh, the mystery of our life here on Earth. We, uh, we have great plans. We have great dreams. We don't know how they're, they're going to turn out. We have to have that trust in God, trust in God's purposes for us, trust in God's love for us, and that if we do our best in this life, God will reward us after death, and we will come to share in the beauty of his presence forever. Well, that's... Uh, little meditation that I, uh, I had. I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Yeah? I remember back uh, years ago, you know, when the fellow talked about David, that, that guy who put his appetite against the lumber. Is that still in the process? Well, um, limbo has more or less dropped out of current theological thinking. Um, and I think, but I think the, uh, you know, but we've, uh, the church is, I mean, limbo was never an official doctrine of the church. Um, it is uh, a doctrine of the church that you know, people have to be baptized or, you know, have an equivalent, you know, uh, uh, experience in order to enter into heaven. And certainly, you know, the love that, you know, parents have for children, whether they actually get baptized or not, is, uh, uh, is important. But I think we need, too, to understand that, that um, you know, I mean, God is not punishing people and, uh, you know, just for the, for the pleasure of punishment. Uh, but I think the, uh, the idea was that, you know, we have to make some commitment to our Lord if we're capable of it. On the other hand, you know, a child, you know, a young child who is baptized, uh, you, don't, you don't say the requiem mass for that child. You say what's called the mass of the angels because we believe that child has gone directly to heaven. So, uh, you know, what happens to, you know, uh, unbaptized children, to, you know, to aborted fetuses? You know, we can't... Uh, 
we can't say definitively, but we can certainly trust in the mercy of God that nothing, you know, uh, you know, terrible is going to be happening to them. But, uh, you know, again, you know, if God, uh, you know, if God looks after the fall of a sparrow and, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, everything that goes on in creation is all under that, uh, uh, that providence of Almighty God, we can certainly trust that he's going to take care of, uh, you know, people who die, you know, uh, in, uh, and, uh, in circumstances like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, do, uh, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, uh, well, you know, I mean, it's, let, let me put it this way, that, um, if, uh, you know, part of, I mean, you know, you can look at it from a, a purely, you know, um, human perspective where you say, well, you know, the people in heaven look down and see these people suffering in hell. And, uh, and you know, the people in hell look up and see the people in heaven and are jealous of them. Uh, but I think, it, I think there's, uh, there is that awareness um, of, uh, you know, what the different states are. And that's not to say that, you know, you're necessarily glad that people are in hell, but, you know, but, in a sense, they chose to be there, and this is where, as I said, you know, they think they belong. They may, you know, they may want some water or a, you know, a nice, you know, ice cream cone or whatever. But at the same time, um, you know, they, uh, you know, this is a logical consequence, you know, uh, of you know their actions, and it's really who they are and what they're. Uh, so what they're experiencing that. Uh, that punishment, that separation from God, is um, you know something that they have freely chosen. And I think this is something that maybe we uh, we don't talk enough about, you know, in the church today, is the uh, the role of free will. And uh, you know, we we have to we make decisions all the time, and you know, we're very good at making ex excuses for the bad decisions that we make, and. But the truth is that, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, and, and, you know, there may be, uh, you know, cases where someone really has no choice or where they, uh, you know, out of ignorance, they make the wrong choice. But often people with full knowledge, or at least the possibility of full knowledge, uh, are choosing, uh, you know, one, uh, one course or the other. And um, I was just talking to someone who, uh, who was down for the 40 days for life at the uh, 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 abortion clinic on Grove Road. And she said that there was, there were, there were you know, the, the pro-life people there, but there were also anti-life people there. <laughs> and, uh, and she said one of these anti-life people had dressed a child up as a devil with horns on them. And, you know, and say, well, what kind of person does this with a child? You know, I mean, it's just, you know, they think that somehow that, uh, you know, this is a, a good thing, that evil is good. Um, I mean, I don't know, I can't explain it, but uh, there are people like that. And, um, you know, I think it's just important to recognize that possibility. And uh, the, um, <clears throat> you know, and we're told that, you know, the, um, you know, that, uh, you know, the people in heaven uh, are, are, and the people in hell are both going to be, um, you know, illustrations of God's justice and his love. Uh, that the two, that love and mercy, love and justice, are not, uh, are not incompatible with one another, but really are the same thing. And, uh, and we will see that, you know, uh, in the judgment. So, 
we can't really explain how that works, but, uh, but I think we need to take, you know, our Lord's words about that seriously. Mm-hmm. Well, well, well. Um, the position of the Catholic Church is that um, all people will be judged according to, um, um, you know, to the standards um, of um, of the gospel and of our Lord Jesus Christ, and really of you know Matthew twenty-five. Um, so it's, uh, you know, and again, we have to trust that God will make allowances for, you know, what people know, the way they've been, been brought up and the circumstances of their lives. But, uh, but certainly, you know, we are going to be, you know, we are all going to be judged. And, um, you know, it's an interesting thing. Mother Teresa's first, um, first house for the dying was a, a place called Kaligat which was a, uh, a guest house next to uh, the temple of a Hindu god, Kali. And um, when Mother Teresa opened this place, the, uh, the, Hindu, the Hindu people complained to the authorities. And, um, and Mother Teresa said, you know, if the Hindus want to take care of the dying, I'm happy to give it back to them. <laughs> They said, well, no, we're not that interested, you know. <laughs> so, so I think there is that, um, you, know, uh, you know, human beings are human beings wherever they are throughout the world. Uh, the, uh, you know, the Christian revelation, we believe, is the final revelation that it is true that, uh, and that if you follow the teachings of Christ, you know, you will... Uh, you know, you will, uh, you know, be able to share, you know, in, uh, in those blessings that he promised to, uh, you know, to those, uh, to those who love him. Uh, but he, he, he also said that he had sheep which were not of, you know, this fold. And certainly, you know, we have that, uh, that missionary uh, imperative, uh, you know, to go out to preach the gospel, to proclaim the good news, whether people accept it or how they accept it, you know, uh, is really, you know, one of those mysteries that, uh, you know, we can't, uh, we can't make any final determination on. But we can, we can say, as a matter of theology, you know, that God is going to judge all people according to, uh, you know, the way they treat others, the way they uh, 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 live out their lives, that, you know, everyone is going to experience some kind of judgment. Non-Christians are not necessarily going to go to hell. Again, it depends on those circumstances of their lives. Yeah, no, that's interesting. You know, they, uh, we just had the feast of Saint Michael, the Archangel, um, <clears throat> uh, last week, and uh, there's a tradition that Saint Michael appears to everyone uh, when, uh, when they're dying and offers them, you know, the choice of, of uh, 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 you know, salvation or uh, damnation, and. <clears throat> So, and it's interesting, too, to read, uh, you know, to read accounts, you know, of people, you know, have been through these near-death experiences or have experienced clinical death and what they, uh, what they go through. And, uh, you know, often, you know, they talk about, you know, kind of going into a, a darkness, and it's not that, uh, it's not necessarily, you know, an extinction kind of dark, but it's that, that mysterious kind of darkness. 
I remember, <laughs> I remember uh, uh, a dear friend of mine died a few years ago, and his wife told me when he was in the hospital in the emergency room, he started singing Old Man River because he thought he was going down to this, to this dark river, you know, of, uh, and passing away. You know, I, you know, I don't know. You know, there are all kinds of traditions like that of to, you know, um, you know, other people say, you know, they have that sense of, of lightness and that sense of, you know, of, you know great, great sense of peace and joy and beauty. You know, they, other people have that sense of, you know, their lives passing before them. You know, all kinds of different, you know, experiences there. But um, certainly we know that, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, we have to be, and this is an interesting thing, too, in our tradition is, you know, we talk about, you know, how important it is to prepare for death. Uh, and mention, you know, people going to confession and talking about these things. But, you know, but trying to, you know, trying to, uh, uh, you know, go back over our lives to, uh, you know, to make amends where we can, to, uh, to apologize to people that, you know, we may have, uh, we may have heard, or, you know, or just to, uh, you know, engage in some kind of charitable activities. You know, one of the beautiful things about, um, uh, you know, the church is that, you know, that, you know, you find people, especially when they're retired and have, uh, you know, a little bit more free time. They like to work for St. Vincent de Paul, or they like to, uh, you know, engage in some kind of ministry as a Eucharistic, uh, extraordinary minister of the Eucharist, or, you know, visiting the sick in the hospitals or nursing homes. You know, there's so many wonderful ministries like that where people, you know, find that they have some time on their hands and they want to give something to others to, uh, and, you know, and, and partly it's, you know, they're good people, but I think it's also that, you know, sense that, you know, they are going to have to give an account of themselves before our Lord, and they want to try to find, you know, some way of, uh, of preparing for that and, uh, and sharing the faith, you know, in some, uh, in some deeper way. So that's... Um, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, if, um, you know, if, uh, you know, if we do good things for people, in, in, in a, you know, hoping for heaven, you know, is that really, you know, I mean, are you going to re reject some, some help because of that, you know? Uh, you know, do you say, you know, I only want, you know, money from atheists, you know, I don't know. It's, uh, uh, you know, I'd, I think that's, uh, and this is part of maybe, you know, you know, we kind of over -psycho, you know, uh, psychoanalyze things today. We really need to, you know, to look at what's in people's hearts. And um, I think, you know, you can tell, you know, the way, uh, the way people um, respond to one another. And especially, you know, I was, um, I'll tell you a story about Prince of Peace. Um, when I came there in, um, 2011, uh, the church was giving, you know, we would give 10% of our collection each week to, um, you know, to some charity. And, you know, I mean, it's a nice idea, but on the other hand, you know, <laughs> we had a million dollars in debt and we, <laughs> you know, we weren't meeting our, you know, weekly budget. It was kind of, you know, kind of silly to, for us to be giving, you know, money away. But I said to, I said to the St. Vincent de Paul people, I said, Listen, instead of us, and they were getting, they would get, you know, the 10% of a collection one Sunday a month. I said, listen, instead of giving us, giving you 10% of the collection, why don't you stand out in the narthex outside of church, you know, and, and, and we'll publicize it. And you stand there with a, uh, you know, uh, a bucket, you know, asking for alms. I said, I guarantee you, you will, you will do better with that. And it will also put a human face on it. Instead of saying, oh, we're just giving this money to St. Vincent de Paul, they'll see who the St. Vincent de Paul volunteers are. They'll be able to talk to you. You'll be able to, you know, uh, explain, you know, what the uh, organization is all about. And, I mean, they make, you know, several times more each month from doing that. And, and people are moved, you know. They'll see that and they'll, you know, write them a check for, you know, Five hundred, a thousand dollars, something like that. Um, so it's, um, you know, but I do think there's that, um, 
you know, that we can, you know, say, oh, well, you know, you're only doing this because you want to get to heaven. Well, <laughs> uh, I guess, yeah, we all want to get to heaven, and, you know, I want you to get to heaven, too, but, uh, uh, but you know, and, um, you know, again, you know, to, to criticize that is to go, you know, totally outside, you know, you know, the whole religious tradition of, uh, of humanity, that, uh, you know, we do believe that, you know, those who do good in this life are going to be rewarded in some way, and those who do evil are going to be punished. Now, exactly how that's going to work out, you know, we can't say, but uh, we have to trust, again, in the mercy of God and uh, trust that, you know, people's motivations will become plain <laughs> at the last judgment, right? So.